Welcome to Lecture 1 of Agriculture. This lecture is to serve as a follow-up to both of the videos that you watched as agriculture greatly relates to many of the issues that we cover in this class, whether or not it's water issues, forestry issues, population issues. What we're going to cover in this lecture is how agriculture has managed to feed the world's exponentially growing population up until now and how those concepts and principles that have carried us through that booming of our world population may not hold so much anymore. However, there is a great amount of debate surrounding that topic. The big question is, in this current day and age we live in, you should have seen this in your readings, you should be seeing this in the videos, is how do we feed the world? There are a lot of opinions out there on this. Some people say that there's not enough food to go around to feed the world. Other people say that it's just imbalanced and there is plenty. Moving aside all those opinions, what it comes down to is it's an issue of resources and the ability to allocate those resources. Is there enough to go around? When we start looking at that, we have to look at non-arable land. This relates to your previous unit on soils. Because if you'll remember when we looked at soils, not all soils are perfect and lots of soils have drawbacks on what they can produce. And so if you look at arable land versus non-arable land, what a lot of agriculture Take, where a lot of agriculture takes place these days is in land that's non-arable unless you bring in that irrigation component. Now with plenty of sunshine and plenty of nutrients and plenty of water crops will grow and irrigation makes that possible in many areas of the world. There are three predominant types of irrigation. The first is flood and furrow. This is by far the oldest of all irrigation methods, and this is just where a field is simply flooded with water. This is often going to be associated with agriculture in river valleys. If you look at some of the river valleys in the United States, this is what you would see going on. You would see this in Washington State with the apple crops. You would see this in the Central Valley of California with a mix of groundwater irrigation as well. and you would see this in many areas in the desert southwest. A lot of these areas you're going to look at in Google Earth. Sprinkler irrigation is going to be associated with your center pivot. This might be one that you're very familiar with if you look at uh, the landscape. If you're flying across the country, you see all those circles. All those circles are irrigation circles. Those are your center pivot irrigation circles. You saw those in the video. That's where you have some type of a sprinkler device going around in circles in a field. And then finally, one of the more advanced ones is drip irrigation. Drip irrigation requires a lot of capital, and the benefit of drip irrigation is that you lose very little water to evaporation. So if you look at these three, you might say that, well, drip, in terms of conservation standpoints, is much better than the other ones. And who would ever want to engage in those other ones? The problem is, is that you have to look at this in terms of pros and cons for each. Because while well, flood and furrow irrigation isn't exactly good for water conservation, many of the current laws that we have in the western United States, which we'll visit in the water unit, really don't promote the use of drip irrigation. Also, if you look at drip irrigation, you have to remember that drip irrigation oftentimes doesn't allow the individual to plow the soil. And if you can't plow the soil, going back into what we are talking about with the no-till agriculture, that means that you're going to have to apply a lot more herbicides and pesticides to that crop. So it's really not any, it's not really not good to say that any one is better than the other. You might say that drip irrigation is the best for water conservation, but in terms of economic reasons, flood irrigation by far would exceed that, unless the water is comes at a fairly high price, then you might want drip. Sprinkler irrigation makes sense if you have some type of a center pivot irrigation system where you're relying on groundwater. We take a look at these irrigation patterns and whether or not surface water or groundwater and we can kind of get an idea of what we're going to be working with sometimes. We look at this area of the country, this swath here, there's really no large rivers in this area for surface irrigation to take place. 
This is going to be predominantly groundwater irrigation. Later on we'll visit this area because this is where what's something called the Ogallala Aquifer is located. We look over in Florida. Th there's not really a lot of rivers in Florida. A lot of this in Florida is is uh, center point irrigation as well. Groundwater based. Over here, some water from the Rio Grande. However, you have quite a bit of groundwater as well. This area comes from the Rio Grande. This area quite a bit of groundwater although you have some diversions from some of the rivers in the area this is your potato growing area this area central valley you have all of that infrastructure in place you're going to visit this this is going to be an area where you have a mix of groundwater and surface water the surface water is used predominantly but as a backup groundwater is used so what we can see here is that irrigation predominantly takes place in the western half of the country where you have a bit of a deficit in rainfall. Not always this area receives plenty of rainfall, but this area is irrigated due to the nature of the soil and due to the nature of the crops grown. Cotton, tobacco, those things like to be irrigated. You get much more yield. Here's an example of a flooded rice field in the desert. Now if we look at this from a water conservation standpoint, this may not make sense because what we have is we have an area with a lot of evaporation and we have a crop grown in an area with a lot of evaporation that requires extensive flooding. Many kinds of water conservationists would look at this and say, is this truly an efficient means of water? And when we look at water, we'll see how this water is coming from some very taxed river systems. Here's a flooded pecan orchard. This is your flood irrigation method. You simply have an area where you have high berms dividing the fields. You can see that berm over here. This, this is probably carrying irrigation water. And at given times of the year, the water is just opened up and the entire orchard is flooded. The water is left to soak into the soil or to evaporate away. Very, very water inefficient, however very, very cheap if the water sometimes is subsidized or if water is readily available. It, it's a very cheap means to do so because all you have to do is tap into an existing river or canal network to do this. This is drip irrigation in a pecan orchard. Notice how with drip irrigation we see the ring of saturated soil around the trees but with drip irrigation, you don't have that water exposed to evaporation. Very little is being lost to evaporation. It's kind of hard for the water to get pulled out of this soil to get evaporated away. However, looking at this, you can see that this could be quite expensive to put in such a system. And if you're dealing with a crop that you might want to plow under, such as corn or chilies or soybeans, and you're irrigating this manner, you are not going to be engaged, able to engage in that plowing operation. You're going to have to combine drip irrigation with no-till agriculture. Here we have center pivot irrigation. So center pivot irrigation, you have your, your pump, your centrifuge pump at the center of the operation. This pump is bringing up water from sometimes several thousand feet below the surface. And this big arm of sprinklers moves around in a circle to give you an irrigated circle of land. Each one of these circles represents a well dipping beneath the surface, pulling up water from, in this case, looking at this image, it's probably a couple thousand feet below the surface. Lots, the, the drawback to this is that this is pretty capital intensive to put in this well. The wells have to get deeper and deeper, and to bring that water up, you have to put in a lot of fuel because those centrifuge pumps run on diesel fuel. When you do your Google Earth assignment and you describe the landscape patterns in that assignment and you look at imagery such as this, think of the irrigation types and think of the, the, the drawbacks and benefits to each of those. Think of the regions of the world that you're in and think of the overall geography as you complete the Google Earth assignment. The Google Earth assignment is very much intended to enhance what you're getting out of this lecture. When we talk about agriculture, we talked about this a little bit 
in the unit on population, but we have to bring in what's known as the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is simply a, a, a byproduct of the Cold War of the latter half of the 20th century. It's a period when agricultural yields went they went up dramatically in the same amount of cropland that was used before. If you look at at this graph right down here, you see in 1961 we had 4.5 billion of hectares of land in production. By 2001, we're not much higher than that. And a lot of the land that went into production is submarginal lands. We look at arable land versus arable land left in the world and really in this day and age and even at the beginning of the 20th century the arable land left to be put into production was pretty much already put in place. The arable land that was put into production in the 1960s much of that was arid lands that got put in production through large water delivery networks. Marginal lands are the only ones left that really are getting put into agricultural production. From the video that you watched the home project you saw that much of the land going to agricultural production these days is former tropical forest or your equatorial forest lands in places like the Amazon rain basin and the Belgian Congo of Africa. How does this graph relate to population? Well this is linear growth but remember population growth is exponential. So if we're not putting more land in production, then how have we been able to keep up with feeding a burgeoning population in the world? And in all actuality, the population explosion that we saw in the 1960s was a product of being able to grow more food on the same amount of land available. That is the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is 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 not just pesticides it's not just high yielding seed varieties it is a collection of ideas and techniques and really what the green revolution is it's modern western type farming techniques that are developed that are that are developed in developed countries and brought to developing countries whether or not that's grain exports or the actual technology itself however what we'll see is that sometimes bringing that technology to a developing country isn't as easy as it seems on the surface. Here you have an example of a high yielding variety of rice. So if you look at traditional rice you would see that it's fairly large, it's tall, and you don't really have that much rice on it. This is an improved, so this could be through selection of the best rice grains to get the better seed. You could have something like this. But ideally what you want is you want a high amount of yield in as small an area as possible so you can grow these rice plants very close to one another. And really that's what the Green Revolution is about, is it's about squeezing in as much yield as possible into as small an area as possible. You look at this green revolution in relation to what production was before and what happened in the 1960s with the green revolution and you can see how much yield went up. Now this change in yield, you look at this and you can see it's kind of happening after World War II. What's happening here is that yes, the green revolution is a collection of ideas and policies and techniques but in order for us to get the high yields, we needed to have some type of an external input. So if we look at this from the perspective of our country, of what we're looking at here, following World War II, we had a lot of explosives left over from the war. We had lots of ammonium nitrate. We had all these factories set up in the Gulf of Mexico to build explosive munitions. So we have all this ammonium nitrate left over. Nobody really knows what to do with the ammonium nitrate. And what was decided is we'll take that ammonium nitrate and apply it to fields. Research has been going on that since world, following World War I. And we'll visit that later on. And so let's take that infrastructure, let's take that ammonium nitrate and apply it to the fields because before we were really limited in corn production by 
rotating that corn out of production so many years to bring the nitrogen back in the soil. Now what we can do with ammonium nitrate is we can put that in ex externally and lo and behold we have the facilities now to make the fertilizer and from there the yields went up. Now we'll visit later on how policy relates to not yield but the amount of production. So yields went up in this country because of the introduction of chemical based fertilizer. However what we'll see is in the 1970s is really when production started to go up and core prices started to fall because more and more people were producing corn. We look at the Green Revolution and this shows you that high yielding varieties you can't take a high yielding variety seed and just plant it in the ground and expect it to grow and produce tons and tons of rice or high amounts of corn. You need to have those inputs. And so with the Green Revolution and those high yielding varieties, you really need the tractors to plant the massive tracts of land. You need the fuel for those tractors or for your irrigation systems. You need to apply the fertilizer. Well, oftentimes you do need to irrigate. The amount of land cultivated though, notice this, stays about the same or in some ways it diminishes. Also what's diminishing? Farm labor. High yielding varieties require a lot of other inputs and that's what all of this stuff over here is. All of these inputs are needed. This is your ideas and techniques associated with the Green Revolution. We look at this in terms of grain production Grain production has gone up, so is meat production. Why? Because the grain that we grow is used to feed to the, to, the, to the animals that we get the meat from. This has implications, as we're going to see later on, in terms of if we have this high of a population and places like Asia start to eat a lot of meat, we're going to run into some issues in terms of how much grain is, going, is out there to support the world's population. Looking here, we can see how the yields have gone up, but the area harvested has pretty much stayed the same, if not diminished. We look at this in another way. We can see that fertilizer use has gone up consistently. Irrigation area has gone up a little bit, but permanent cropland has pretty much stayed the same, if not gone down. So what we have is we're just putting a lot more external inputs into this cropland to give us higher yields. The dilemma though that's being visited over and over again, what you saw in uh, predominantly in the Project Home video, but what was mentioned in the, in the film Food Incorporated as well, was are we in a saturation period of agriculture? Have we reached a point now to where agriculture is no longer sustainable and we're also in a period where we're going to start getting diminishing yields. That is up for debate. However, what the numbers are showing is that it takes much, much more input and we're getting lesser and lesser yields without the greater inputs we put in. What is that saying? That's saying the ratio of crop output to energy input is diminishing. We have to put a lot more external energy into that crop to get the same amount of to get amount of energy out. We have to put in all that fossil fuel energy in the terms of mechanized labor. We have to put in all of that energy into the seed production. We have to put in all that energy in terms of fertilizer and water. What are we getting out in terms of energy units is not the same as what we're putting in. And every year, year by year, that ratio gets bigger and bigger in terms of the in terms of what we have to put in versus what we get out. And so if you say, well, harvests are only getting bigger, yes, harvests are getting bigger all by slightly. Sometimes if you look in different areas, they're diminishing. But what we have is it takes more input versus the energy output.
here we have an issue associated with with the green revolution because not only do you have those techniques not only of those inputs you also have issues surrounding policy we look at something like corn prices right away in here we can see that corn prices spiked in the war years and that makes sense because that's when the government was buying up all that grain to support the war effort following those war years though you see a plummet in corn prices this is really bad if you're a farmer because you don't want to grow something that you're not going to get a lot of money for well what happened is in this period when corn prices were falling you had a lot of people growing corn all by not too much then there was famine in the world there was famine in China there was a problem in the Soviet Union and the United States wanted to sell more of its corn but we didn't have enough because of declining corn prices not that many people were growing corn and not as many as what we could have exported overseas so in the 1970s we instituted a policy that said we were going to subsidize corn we were going to subsidize these things so there would never be a problem and we could ensure that we could export plenty of corn so the government said grow as much corn as you want but and you grow as much as you want and we'll just cover the cost on where you take a financial hit because the corn prices have gone down so much that's indeed what happened is if you look at the trend corn prices went down 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 well in the 1990s this was looked at as a really bad thing in the 1990s we began to explore something called ethanol production from corn everyone liked this idea environmental groups like the idea the corn growers like the idea fuel companies like the idea everyone thought this was a great idea because this trend people thought oh my god we're just paying these people to grow the corn and there's a glut of it on the market so is this still accurate well I want you to click on this link to tell me so because if you click on this link what you're going to end up getting is you're going to look and see that corn prices have gone up why the ethanol this is an unforeseen trend in declining corn prices so ethanol has really changed the way corn prices have been looked at however is this a good thing or is this a bad thing we're going to visit that issue again when we get into our energy section but looking at this here we have some information that shows us how much corn is subsidized corn is a very su heavily subsidized farm commodity since 1995 up until 2009 and the subsidies have actually gone up in many ways this country has spent seven nearly 76 billion dollars subsidizing corn production is that a good thing is that a bad thing this is up for debate now on my, on my end of the spectrum I would say that this is not a good thing because if we look at the environmental costs if we look at what the subsidy is versus what the price of corn is we look at things like rising food prices to me subsidizing something to grow to make fuel doesn't make sense however this is a, a subject that is very debatable and will be debated as we look at where our energy needs come from this gets into the law of unforeseen consequences so in the 19 in the 1970s when we enacted that policy and said hey we're gonna grow you can grow as much corn as possible because we want to be able to export this to the world market because of the Cold War we did not see the price of corn falling that dramatically in the 1990s when we said that we were going to start looking at ethyl ethanol production we did not foresee what that would do in terms of the price of corn we look at this and we can see right here how ethanol production 
is very, very much correlated with the corn price in terms of dollar per bushel. Now, it says during 2006 through 2008, corn prices rose as more was used for ethanol, but other factors also had major impacts. <coughs> yes, that is totally true. And that's why I'm providing you with, the, with this link so you can take a look at those other issues. But overall, taking all those issues into the picture, we can still see a very, very closely correlated trend between how ethanol production has related to corn prices. And so you're saying to yourself, that's not a big deal. Corn prices are going up. But what that's going to do now is that's going to raise food prices. And when food prices rise, you have to remember that other countries of the world are buying our food. And when our corn prices rise, their corn prices rise. And it becomes to where other countries in the world can't compete with us because we're subsidizing our farmers. And you have issues. We live in a global economy. And that's a very important concept to understand when you look at conservation issues is that it's not just the United States. Rising corn prices in the United States means that you can have food riots in other countries of the world as we saw in places like Mexico. Here we have primary uses of U.S. corn. Well, we can see that corn still predominantly the number one use for corn is livestock feed. But we see this ethanol ethanol use is getting up there to where it's matching how much feed we're feeding animals so if we have that much ethanol going into if that we have that much corn going into ethanol production and then we look at livestock feed what do you think that's going to do to the price of meats and foods in general that's going to change the prices on what we pay at the grocery store We look at this and we'll see that corn is by far the number one recipient of subsidies in the country. These are all subsidies. These are all government subsidies, number of recipients of these subsidies. So when we look at this stuff and we look at changing our policy and we look at what might be the magic fix to a solution, it's very important and this is one thing that it's difficult to do in a virtual class but you really want to take a critical look at these issues right now the Department of Defense is interested in going over to clean energy they're talking about pursuing renewable energy and this is a very good thing it's it's great that the Department of Defense is progressive on this issue however what's being pushed is biofuels so we have to ask ourselves, and we'll get into this when we get into energy, what happens when you have that many people in the armed forces using biofuels? What is that going to do in terms of the implications on the cost of our food and our fuel? The, this is why we have all of these different sides of view that I try to bring into place on these concepts.